While groups like Linkin Park, Korn, and Limp Bizkit were some of the most successful new metal acts during the late 90s and early 2000s, there was another tier of bands that didn't quite achieve the same level of commercial success, but they were still hugely influential. In the case of Static X, they had an industrial edge to them, and they were sometimes referred to their music as evil disco music, or as I've seen in some publications, techno metal or disco metal. Their debut album, Wisconsin Death Trip, would be a platinum seller and also made many best of lists for the greatest new metal albums. In today's video, let's take a look at the history of Wisconsin Death Trip. Frontman and rhythm guitarist Wayne Static would be born Wayne Richard Wells in Michigan. Wayne's mother would remark how her son was pretty laid back as a kid and wasn't a troublemaker and was a strong student academically. Wayne was exposed to music through his mom who played organ for the church and at the age of three, he even got a toy guitar from his parents, which he called the Botar, that he slept with. His parents knew from an early age that music was going to play an important part of their son's life. Wayne would get his first real guitar at the age of seven, and his neighbor taught him how to play. His first public performance was when he was in the second grade and won a local talent competition after doing a rendition of Skip to My Lou. The prize for that competition was playing for some old ladies, at a luncheon that they were having. Wayne would joke in an interview that old ladies loved him despite his appearance that would make you think otherwise. It was at the age of nine he saw a cover of Kiss Alive and he fell in love with the band. Wayne soon had these dreams of being Paul Stanley and he loved the showmanship and theatrics of Kiss. He even had this fantasy that Paul Stanley would one day quit the band and since no one knew what Paul Stanley looked like under the makeup, and Wayne would be asked to fill in. But Kiss wasn't the only group he was into, as he'd cite groups like Black Sabbath, Aerosmith, Rush, as well as Prong. Wayne would join the high school marching band, and by the time he became an adult, he soon found one of his biggest influences, the group Ministry, who hailed from Chicago. At one point, Wayne even worked at a record store where he was a buyer and he listened to a lot of dance music as well. Wanting to follow in Ministry's footsteps, he would move to Chicago where he would befriend future Smashing Pumpkins leader Billy Corgan, and they even played in a band together for a brief period of time called Deep Blue Dream, taking its name from a lyric by The Doors. They also had a bass player named Eric Harris, and future Static X drummer Ken Jay was also part of the group. Corgan actually introduced Wayne to Ken Jay, as Wayne would recall how they met telling Ultimate Guitar, I was actually introduced to Ken by Billy Corgan. Billy had been playing in the band and we were looking for a drummer and he's the one who worked at a record store with Kenny. He's like, I've got this guy that works at this record store with me that plays drums, so Billy introduced us. Ken J auditioned with Billy and Wayne for the drummer spot telling Ladder Sound. I go in and play for maybe 30 seconds and Wayne just stops me. I think, oh, he hates me and he goes, Ken, we'd pay you to play in this band, and that was it. Corgan at the time had already started the Smashing Pumpkins, but they were relatively unknown and they didn't even have a drummer. But Deep Blue Dream, which was a post-punk group, was growing in size and getting a decent following. But Corgan left the band because he wanted to do his own thing, and of course he'd go on to have an enormous amount of success with the Smashing Pumpkins. After Corgan left, Deep Blue Dream was over. The group did, however, have one sole release. They released an EP in 1988. Wayne would go on to play in a thrash metal outfit called Battery, which also featured Ken J. They came to LA in 1993 to do a recording session, and it was upon returning to Chicago that the weather was really cold, much colder than LA, as you can imagine, and Wayne made the decision that he had enough of the city and wanted to move to Los Angeles because the climate was better and he was also tired of chasing a recording contract, giving up hopes that he'd ever get signed. The job that Wayne was working at the time in Chicago actually had an office in Los Angeles so he was able to transfer. Wayne worked at a job for eight years doing summaries of TV newscasts for the news clipping service, Burrell's. He would tell MTV his job was to basically watch the news for eight hours straight in the middle of the night in a cold office building. He liked the job though because he was able to take time off to do touring and his boss didn't mind his hairstyle. Moving to LA with Wayne in January of 94 would be his bandmate Ken J. Wayne would get two credit cards, one he used to buy a pickup truck and the other he used to live off of. While Wayne gave up any hopes of ever making a living 
As a musician, he still planned on playing music just for fun and to meet some other like-minded people. But when the pair arrived in LA, it was a pretty weird scene. Jay would describe to the LA Times what they found in Los Angeles' music scene in early 1994, recalling, We noticed the only guys in Hollywood with really long hair were washed up old glam rocker dudes who never made it and were still hanging on to their glory days. And the new metal scene hadn't really taken off yet. Jay would admit the pair did play some shows with these so-called glam bands in LA. He'd highlight playing a show with one band he wouldn't name, seeing the band have fan techs who would set up fans so their hair would blow away from their face. It was at that point both Wayne and Jay decided to shave their long hair off, and they would end up reconnecting with Billy Corgan as a Smashing Pumpkins frontman told Sirius XM here. Or, I don't know, I think it was at a Pantera show. I'm in the balcony and this guy comes up to me, but he's got the hair, you know, this is the Static X Wayne. And I look at him like, I know that face, but this hair is out there. And he goes, Billy, it's Wayne. And I was like, oh my God, like what happened to you? And he's like, I'm just starting this band. And he was telling me about it. And I remember thinking, oh man, LA trying to start a metal band in, in 90, whatever year it would have been, 94, 95. I thought, oh, with, this is the height of grunge. I'm thinking, oh, you're starting a metal band. That's going to be a tough one. But I knew Wayne was talented. And so we had a nice conversation. I wished him luck, said, stay in touch. Next thing you know, a couple of years goes by and there's Wayne on MTV with the crazy hair. And what's interesting is I always knew Wayne was a talented guy. But I think what's cool is I think people now realize that Static X was one of those bands that was way ahead of the curve because Wayne was that type of dude. He would have felt stuff coming. Wayne would be adamant years later that had him and Ken not moved to Los Angeles, he likely wouldn't have had success in the music business and he'd still be working at an office job. It was two months after arriving in LA, the pair were working for Ticketmaster manning the phones when they met bassist Tony Campos, who was playing in a metal band at the time. He'd stay in his band for the time being, but also played with Wayne and Ken. They formed a new band with the same guitarist from Battery around this time called Drill. Their guitarist, though, soon left and got into musical production for TV and movies, working on the music for Power Rangers as well as Planet of the Apes. And he worked with a variety of high profile musicians, including Rod Stewart. It was around this time Wayne also wanted to get another guitar player because he always thought of his guitar playing style being in line with Metallica's James Hetfield and he wanted someone who was a little more flashy to play lead. So the trio would rehearse in downtown LA and they put up an ad for a guitarist. Wayne would reveal to Ultimate Guitar that they found guitarist Koichi Fukuda revealing. He would recall Koichi had a band that rehearsed across the hall from us. We put up a sign on the bulletin board that we're looking for a guitar player and he, we got a knock on the door and it was Koichi standing there and he'd actually taken the ad down off the bulletin board and just handed it to me and said, I'm your new guitar player. The Japanese guitarist would be the fourth lead guitar player to play with the trio, who at the time were using the moniker Static. Fukudo, however, soon quit the band, frustrated by a punk face Static was going through. They were doing a lot of covers by The Circle Jerks and Black Flag. Ken Jay would tell the This Just Happened podcast that the band soon grew bored of the music they were working on, so they started experimenting with other styles of music, including goth, industrial, and alternative. Wayne soon realized that as much as he loved groups like Slayer and Pantera, he was never going to outdo those guys and he instead had to carve out his own niche. He went back and looked at all the phases of his life and his musical inspirations at those times and took all of them and simply put them together. But he also bored from what was happening at this point in time, which is around 1994-1995. Coming out in 1995 was White Zombie's final studio album, Astro Creep 2000, which also had a lot of electronic elements in it. Wayne was also influenced by the likes of Chemical Brothers, as well as The Prodigy and System of a Down, who were part of the LA music scene. Wayne would come up with what he described as evil disco, as he told an interviewer here. I just kind of started the, you know, jamming around, you know, for, for fun, really, just kind of doing things with a joke, you know. I, I, I remember, like, one of the early songs, you know, we'd start with a drum mach machine with like a disco beat, like, nsh, 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 nsh. and then we just like, let's just speed it up really fast. So it's really stupid, you know, nsh, 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 nsh. And, you know, and then just started like playing some really stupid guitar riff, like a, like a keyboard, you know, <laughs> just a really dumb, stupid crap, you know, and, and just throw it all together 
and then I'll just scream over everything, you know, just like, ah, as loud as I can over everything. And somehow it kind of took form and, and people started digging it and coming to our shows and, and uh, things just kind of happened, you know, in, in a matter of a, a year or two. Koichi soon rejoined the band and everything seemed perfect. There was a burgeoning new metal scene in the LA clubs by the mid 90s, dominated by the likes of Cold Chamber, Snot, and System of a Down. The group Static would record a six song demo tape that they sold at shows and at their first gig, they sold about 40 copies of that demo tape according to the LA Times. Jay would tell the newspaper, we were driving home and going, what just happened? That never happened. We couldn't even give our old demos away. Static soon also became regulars at the Troubadour and they signed with a management company that was run by Andy Gold. Gold at the time had a deal with Warner Brothers and they would be the first band he brought to the label and they soon nabbed a recording contract in 1997 but it wasn't a smooth process. The negotiations took nearly a year after one of the big wigs of the label, a guy named Stephen Baker, who loved Static, left the company, throwing everything they'd worked for in jeopardy, but eventually things worked out for them. Tony would tell Louder Sound, we got in on the tail end of that, just as Cold Chamber were pretty big, System of a Down, Snot, they were all on the cusp of getting deals, we just rolled along with it. Static would be signed to an imprint label that was distributed through Warner Brothers. During the making of their debut album, some of the members, including their bassist Tony Campos, kept his day job and it just happened that the studio that they were recording in was next to where he worked. The group's debut record titled Wisconsin Death Trip would be recorded in about eight weeks. The album would take its name from a non-fiction book released in 1973 by Michael Lessie. Wayne's sister had that book on her coffee table years earlier and the name always stuck with him and of course, the subject matter did as well. The book discusses the bizarre and tragic incidents that took place in Jackson County, Wisconsin in the late 19th and early 20th century around Black River Falls. The book explores the harsh living conditions in the rural areas of the Midwest, while also seeing the people battle crime, mental illness, changing economic prospects, and urbanization. Since the band was using the name Static up until this point, there was at least a dozen other bands with the same name. So at the insistence of the group's lawyer, they had to entertain new names and Wayne initially wanted to call the band Wisconsin Death Trip. The label though didn't like it as they thought it was too long and they didn't like the word death being in the name. So they came up with Static X taking Wayne's name and that of a moniker Tony used in one of his previous bands where he referred to himself as Tony X. The band originally wanted to record their first record with producer Terry Date, whose credits included Pantera and Soundgarden, as well as Prong and White Zombie. But being a newer band with a limited budget, they couldn't afford him, so instead they hired a guy named Ulrich Wild, who was cheaper and had actually worked a lot with Date. Wild would tell an interviewer about the group's first record, stating, Static X ended up with the term Evil Disco and keeping Disco Evil, there was an odd thing about this record, which was half a rave and the other half was a mosh pit. And at a live show, you'd have all these dudes headbanging at the front and chicks dancing in the back. And that's what was so fun about this record. But the members were under no illusions that they'd ever find an audience. As Wayne told the LA Times in 2000, I remember when we were mixing our record and our manager was in there going, you guys need to sing more so it can be on the radio. And we were like, what? We're never going to get played on the radio. Who cares? What are you talking about? The first taste the public got of Static X would be the song Blood For Days, which would end up on the Bride of Chucky soundtrack, which came out months before their debut record was set to be released. It was a radio station in Phoenix, KUPD, that started playing the song. Static X soon did a month long mini tour in November of 98. They had a few weeks off in December, and then they also did a New Year's Eve show with Slayer in San Diego, and then they did some shows with Fear Factory a few months before their debut record, Wisconsin Death Trip, came out in March of 99. Blood for Days was going to be re-released initially as the first single, but Push It was selected because according to Wayne, that's the first song that people really grabbed onto during their live shows. Push It would even make a debut on MTV's program 120 Minutes since Headbangers Ball didn't exist anymore. And it was also on active rock radio and it came quite close to being on top 40 radio as well. Blood for Days would be re-released as the third single from the record and also appeared on the soundtrack for the film Universal Soldier, which came out in the summer of 99. 
Static X would also release the single I'm With Stupid from the same record. All three singles would end up charting in the States, and by 2001, the album would be certified platinum, surpassing a million copies sold. The album topped the Heat Seekers chart and peaked at number 107 on the Billboard 200 chart. It was in the summer of 99 the band got a major publicity boost when they toured as part of Ozfest. The timing really couldn't have been any more perfect because new metal was quite popular. But the band with its dance sound also cast a wider net than the typical 18 to 24 demographic who were consuming new metal with the LA Times profiling a nine-year-old kid who got a record signed from the band for his mother. Wayne would tell the paper, I think they're responding to the disco beats. My mom is about 60 years old and she loves our music because she can bounce around to it. That's what a lot of people identify with. Wayne also, of course, garnered a lot of attention for his Don King-like hairstyle and his long beard, which he admitted to the Arizona Republic, involved some people coming and touching his hair and beard without asking for permission. Wayne would credit Kiss for inspiring his look, as he even played in a Kiss cover band growing up and believed in having an extraordinary appearance. And that, of course, would help the band differentiate themselves from other groups on the Sunset Strip. Despite the high profile opportunities though, they were still a relatively new band and Static X would tour for nearly three years with their seven member crew all crammed into an RV for their first album. But following the band's first record, the success also created its own issues within the group. The tours would prove to be long and grueling. There were also creative differences, substance abuse and band members quitting, leading to the group taking a hiatus in 2011. Wayne would sadly die in late 2014 due to what the coroner would claim was natural, despite excessive prescription drugs and alcohol being in his system. His wife, Tara Ray, would take her own life two years later. The band would reunite in 2018 with, at the time, an unidentified singer named Zero, who wore a mask that kind of resembled Wayne. It would receive mixed reviews from fans and the press, and they've since released two more albums, including Project Regeneration Volume 1, and most recently this year's Project Regeneration Volume 2 with Wayne's vocals. The singer was said to be Edsel Dope from the band Dope. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again in Rock and Stories. Take care.